So thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, today we're going to be talking a little bit about analytics organization structures. Um, so just a little bit about me. My name is Amanda Tesco. I am a principal consultant at Thoroughgood. Um, I've been here for about 13 years. And during that time, I've helped a range of customers with some of their enterprise BI and analytics applications. And today's topic, it's one that's kind of near and dear to my heart because I've been speaking with a number of customers recently about the way designing organizations can really help enable analytics. In terms of my background, I've got a degree in um, business from Bucknell University, and I am about two weeks away from finishing my MBA at Wharton. And so a lot of this organizational theory is just something I've been spending a lot of time thinking about uh, recently, and I thought it'd be good to just share a bit wider. For those of you who are not familiar with Thoroughgood, we are an independent BI and analytics consulting firm. Uh, we are a global organization. We have offices in the US, the UK, India, um, Singapore, and uh, Brazil. Um, and we work with our customers on a range of different strategy solutions and services that pertain to BI and analytics with a strong focus in data engineering, data science, and data visualization. Today, we'll be talking a little bit more about strategy and direction. We do quite a bit of that, as well as the actual implementation um, training and support. We work with a number of blue chip customers, and they typically draw from the consumer goods, pharma and life sciences, um, banking and insurance sectors. And I've listed a couple there. When I talk about some of our experiences today, this will at least give you a sense of some of the organizations and conversations or um, projects that I'll be drawing from. We are an independent consultancy in that we partner with a range of different technologies, and we really specialize in the enterprise integration across different technologies. Today's session won't be specific to any one technology, but if you find you've got questions throughout about how some of these principles of organization design um, can work with different skill sets or different types of tools, um, feel free to reach out to me and I'm happy to talk about any of these or the way they might work together. So with that um, behind us, the agenda for today's session is fairly straightforward. I thought I'll start today with just setting a little bit of the context. So why are so many organizations talking uh, to me right now about organization design and analytics? What's kind of causing that in the environment that we live in today? Then I thought I'll talk a little bit conceptually about the notion of grouping, linking, and aligning as really um, components to any good organizational strategy and the ways that they might come into play in your organization when you think about analytics. I wanted to touch a little bit on the notion of centralized and decentralized because that's a topic people have asked quite a bit about in terms of where your analytics function gets its guidance from and how it fits within the wider kind of macro org structure of your company. And then I wanted to talk a little bit about skills mix, because this is something that has been a really hot topic in figuring out how do you create these teams or squads that have the right mix of skills to be able to deliver analytics effectively. So there's quite a bit today. I'll cover them each at a high level, but I'm more than happy to share my contact information and to talk in more depth about any of these. So with that, let's get started with just setting the context a little bit. And this is really kind of just a stream of consciousness of some of the um, conversations or points that have kind of come up in, in the recent year or so as we start to think about evolving our analytic structures. And I thought I'll just share some of that thinking with you so that you have that context when we go into the meat of the session. The first one is that we're all kind of very aware of what's happening in the world today with the adoption of cloud, artificial intelligence, ML, digital transformation, uh, the pandemic. I mean, these are things that we, are just um, getting a lot of, of time um, in our in our thoughts recently. And all of these things are really changing the dynamics of how our teams operate. That's analytics teams, but every team kind of in, in the world at the moment. And so I think that this kind of change is something that has really prompted people to start thinking much more about how their teams evolve. In this world where there is rapid technology development and really increasing uncertainty, I think something that we've talked to a lot of our um, customers about and something that we're talking about internally as well is the notion of really having short term plans um, and coupling that with a high level long term vision. Um, but what's really not that practical today are these sort of medium term plans. So what we've been looking at is thinking about bringing agility into short term planning, but having a site set on a North Star vision of where we're going consistently. And a lot of this kind of aligns really well, but we've also seen more and more companies needing to move towards DevOps and MLOps, which you may be familiar with those concepts. If you're not, we have a ton of content on our website about them, 
But what those really are changes in the methodology that analytics organizations have been using really meant to enable organizations to deliver and recognize value faster. And these sorts of methodologies are just more and more important in a world where there is this uncertainty and rapid development of technology. So with that kind of in mind, I think a lot of companies are thinking about the skills that they need and the transformations that have to happen within their analytics organizations to be able to work with some of these methodologies and to make the most of them. Something else that I thought was just worth mentioning is that many of our customers have been talking about whether to kind of build, borrow, or buy uh, the talent and skills that they need. So I think there's been a strong recognition, recognition that the skills necessary in analytics organizations have, have always been evolving, but have been evolving very rapidly recently. And that's left a lot of organizations having to think about the best way to acquire those skills and to make sure that they have them on hand, whether that's in house or something that they kind of borrow. And we'll talk a lot more about this towards the end of the session, but I think this is a, a really important aspect of thinking about how you design your organization because it will it will give you a better sense of how you build or buy talent. Um, the other thing I thought worth mentioning is just that the shape and design of the team really has to work within the wider structure of the organization. And we'll talk about this a little bit today when we talk about centralized and decentralized. Um, but I think something we found is that a lot of our customers are asking like, what is the best way to organize? Or, you know, how are you seeing other companies do it? And I think those are really good um, points of information for anybody to consider, but there is no one kind of gold dust solution to it. And a lot of it is gonna be shaped on the overarching culture and the overarching structure that that analytics organization fits within too. So I think one of the most valuable things you can do is sort of recognize that there is a bit of a uniqueness in the way any of these um, teams will be organized and what will work for one organization might not work as well for another. So being conscious of the pros and cons of the different decisions that you make and the ways you might mitigate that allows you to kind of shape uh, a structure that works best for your organization. And then the last thing I'll say is we, you know, what do we really mean when we say structure, when we talk about that analytics organizational structure? And what we mean, or at least what we mean in, in the presentation today is thinking about the roles, the responsibilities, the skills, and the points of collaboration that are necessary to be able to allow these analytics teams to flourish. And we think that a good structure has to consider all of these aspects, not just kind of how you draw boundaries around groups, but how they interact together. And it really has to be adaptable and flexible. So not having a structure makes it really difficult to get anything done, but having too much structure or structure that's too rigid causes us to design for kind of more um, specific problems and doesn't allow the breadth um, that's necessary to really deal with some of these new issues that are evolving on a day-to-day -day basis as new needs or requests kind of come to the team. So I thought I'll just start there with giving you a little bit of my kind of overarching thinking. And we're gonna dig into some of these points a little in a little bit more detail. The first one I really wanna talk about is just the notion of how we think about organizational structure in our businesses. And there are some kind of fundamental aspects of organizational design. When most people think about how they design their organization, the first thing that they think about oftentimes is grouping. Um, and you can think of grouping as just drawing boundaries around people to identify individuals to be a part of a group, either formally or a part of a subunit. And there's a lot of consideration that often goes into how we group our teams. We might think about, do we group it by business function? So is there a team that sits in sales, a team that sits in finance? Do we group it by business unit, by different product lines we have or different offerings that we have? It could be by customer, or it could be some hybrid mix, which you know, in a lot of large enterprise organizations, there's inherently some aspect of that kind of hybrid nature. We'll talk about this more in the next slide, but every grouping decision that you make is the wrong one. There is no home run answer to grouping. Every grouping comes with some serious drawbacks. And so when a lot of people think about grouping from an organizational design perspective, they tend to think that they're kind of stuck living with some of the drawbacks of any individual approach. Something that we think is really important when thinking about how your analytics organization is structured is considering two other aspects, and that is linking and aligning. So what do we mean by linking? Anytime you've drawn boundaries around people, you have to be just as intentional in drawing those boundaries with how you link those groups back together. And though I think uh, conceptually this makes sense to a lot of people, 
linking tends to get a lot less focus than grouping. We tend to debate who's in the team, who's not in the team, what are the teams, and but we don't debate as much how those teams get linked together. And oftentimes we can think of linking as a liaison, so somebody who might span two teams, um, or it could be groups that meet that span, uh, it could be teams that meet that span those groups as a way to link and share information between the two. But I think there are a number of other elements that aren't often um, considered as much, which is using systems or frameworks to facilitate that linking. So if there's a framework that um, guarantees that different groups connect at different points in a project or an engagement, or if there are different systems or methodologies in place um, that make sure the information gets shared between those groups better, those sorts of things can help quite a bit. And you'll see when we talk about some of the drawbacks of different grouping approaches that linking can be really, really important in mitigating some of the challenges that come with any grouping you choose. And then aligning kind of comes third, but is in some ways the most important. Once you've defined how those groups work and how they should link together, what those touch points are, how information gets shared, how do you really incentivize people to operate within the structures and not subvert them? Because with all the best organizational design in the world, if you've not aligned the incentives of the individuals to operate within those structures and links that you've created, then the subversion of that structure just diminishes any of the value that you may get. So thinking about ways to align those teams could be around individual or group bonuses. It could be about performance management. It might be about just having a shared vision. It doesn't all have to be kind of formal um, HR type things. But there needs to be a way to orient the people in these groups towards behaving in the way that we want. And so I use this as a little bit of an introduction because I think the next bit will demonstrate a little bit more about what I mean when, when we start with grouping, how every grouping has some positive things and some every grouping has some challenging aspects to it as well. So what are some common ways that we have seen analytics organizations grouped at this sort of macro level within organizations? And what I'll do here is I'll plot things on a bit of a spectrum with centralized on the left and decentralized on the right. So if we think about an analytics organization that is entirely centralized, in this type of scenario, the analytics team reports to and acts as a central body. And um, typically the direction and um, the prioritization and funding for analytics comes from some sort of strategic corporate level. Um, more commonly, we're seeing chief analytics officers that might guide this team. Um, we're seeing, you know, in some instances, analytics teams reporting to the strategy division within organizations, rather than more kind of traditional analytics teams reporting to IT functions. In this centralized approach, there is a lot of value in having your analytics team operate in this way, where the analytics team is guided by central functions and then supports the business units and business functions on the initiatives that are set by that central um, body. One of the pros of this is that you can really get the value of cross-functional and cross-business unit projects because you are thinking about analytics very strategically and in the ways that it can transform the business at a very macro level. It's also a really good way to share ideas because that team is working across a number of different use cases. Um, and it's really good for priority setting. Um, it makes sure that the analytics function is oriented towards the highest priority things for the business, not necessarily the functions or units that are the most well-funded or that have the most influence over what gets done, but that it's really thinking kind of cross-functionally and cross units of what will deliver the most value. With that, however, obviously comes some drawbacks. And the one main drawback here is that it tends to be a little bit unresponsive to individual business unit and business function needs because its direction comes from the center. And if there is a specific need within uh, your marketing department, for example, and that need doesn't register at a central level, then that might leave your business units or business functions feeling slightly underserved. It is also challenging because that analytics function might lack some of the domain knowledge that's necessary. If you're using this central pool of analysts to try to address any problem within the business, there might not be enough domain expertise within that group to really be able to do them justice. And so recognizing some of the pros and cons of this type of approach, what we've seen many companies implement over the last decade or so is this move towards more of a center of excellence type of approach. And this is starting to break down the centralized aspects a little bit and make them a bit more decentralized. 
in this scenario, your analytics groups sit within business units and functions, um, but the COE, the Center of Excellence, acts as a coordinating board and a priority setting board across units and functions. Some of the pros of this is that if you're looking, looking at things like creating um, training or coordination of how data gets stored and managed, the COE is pretty influential in doing these things. Governance tends to happen a lot better. And you've got your analysts within the individual functions and units, so you get a little more of that domain expertise and a little bit more of a guide from what is needed at a more nuanced business level. However, some of the cons of this we've seen is that in the center of excellence models, um, the COE tends to not have as much strategic influence as in more centralized models. So though the COE kind of supports the whole business, it's tended, it tends to be seen more as a support function or a central service rather than a function that is critical to driving the strategy of the organization. Um, so there's a little bit of the kind of orientation of the COE in this type of format that can be a bit of a challenge. We've also found that a lot of times that COE has limited control over the decentralized staff. So in those scenarios, the power really still resides with the analytics functions that sit within the units, which might diminish some of the power of the central aspect of it. Moving a little bit more to the right, some organizations tend to take more of a functional approach. And this is where the analytics group might sit across, serve across business units, but sit within a specific business function. So you might think about this as having analytics teams that sit within your marketing department or your sales department or in insurance, for example, it's you know, very common to have a set of analysts that sit in your underwriting department. It might sit within functions, but cross different units. So it might be used across different product lines or different markets, depending on how you structure. The value of this is that activities tend to get a pretty strong business focus. Um, those functions tend to kind of give good business focus to the analytics functions. And it does allow for really good collaboration across units. So if you're learning something within marketing that can be applied to the different business units that you have, that's like a really good way to get shared, sharing it to happen across these. Some of the cons are that it tends to limit the ability um, to expand work to other functions. Um, so if cross-functional solutions are really valuable to your organization and many of the complex companies we work with, it's those cross-functional solutions, the ones that bring together business development and supply chain, for example, that provide insights that aren't as easily found in the organization. This type of more functional structure that's a bit more decentralized starts to lose some of the ability to do that naturally. And then all the way on the right, the most kind of um, dramatic kind of form of decentralized is to really have analytics teams sit within the business units and within the business functions and have very little coordination or collaboration across them. Now, the pros of this is that the business tends to get what they think they want, um, but the con is that it tends to not be that suitable for enterprise applications. You tend to have data sitting in a number of different repositories. There's not much central force around the tools that are used or the technology, the, the skills that are created within the organization. And in many ways, this sort of happens as a lack of structure, not necessarily as an intended structure. So hopefully that gives a little bit of a sense of that kind of range of macro level organizational structures for analytics. There are certainly flavors of this that you know take a bit from each, um, but the key point here is to recognize that at that level, there are pros and cons to every structure you've got to work in. And grouping alone will always create different pros and cons. So you've got to think about ways to use linking and aligning to try to mitigate some of those cons. And being aware of where where your organization is in this kind of at this macro level is very helpful because that allows you to think that at an analytics team level, how you structure that team, um, you can think a little bit more specifically about what you're having to cater for, what some of the pitfalls are given the structure that, that you sit in. So with that, I thought I'd talk a little bit about the dynamics at the micro level of what the analytics team uh, makeup might actually look like. I'm sure you've seen this or some rendition of this um, commonly. So a recognition that within any team, we really need to have um, a, some sort of business stakeholder, somebody who can provide domain expertise, somebody who might be responsible for encouraging adoption within the business so that we're not developing analytic solutions that don't get used. There's obviously the need for a data engineer when you're thinking of doing these things at, at scale, somebody who can really understand how to operationalize enterprise data 
who can transform it, store it, make it accessible. And then more and more commonly in, in the past, you know, five, 10 years, the inclusion of a data scientist in this team. So how do we build analytical models that might use statistics or mathematics to really be able to assist in decision making? And I think many people have been asking recently, you know, how do you structure this team and what skills do you really need? Can these be separate people? Do they have to be the same people? Um, and I think where a lot of the kind of pause starts to, starts to come in is that many people have business stakeholders, data scientists, and data engineers. The question is, do you have enough of the overlapping skills to do the things that you need? And when you're thinking about, say, the overlap between data science and data engineering, there are some, some projects that will really require that you have somebody who understands both. Do you have enough people in the organization to fulfill those roles? Um, even within the business side, so do you have a business stakeholder holder who can speak enough of the data scientist language to be able to collaborate with the data scientist on getting really good analytical models? So I think where a lot of people have been focusing is how do we create some of these cross sections where we need it? But the thing that concerns people the most is that there are some scenarios where that intersection of all three is really, really critical. Now, in an ideal world, you have a wealth of resources who can do all of these things, but we know that that's very hard to find on the market. We know that the skill sets necessary to have all of these things in one person isn't impossible to find, but it's quite challenging. So if you're thinking about how do you build a team, where do you focus on investing your time and energy in building skills or buying skills or borrowing skills, which we'll talk about in, in two slides, to be able to do all of the different things the organization needs to do. And I think my advice to, to people so far has been to think about what skills do the specific needs dictate? Um, there are probably a number of needs within your organization that will be met just fine by having a team working closely together who has separate skills, but is really good at working together. And what we're seeing is a lot of organizations creating these squads that use a combination of a business um, representative, data scientist, and a data engineer working in close collaboration to try to create something that, that provides value to the business. What percentage of the needs in the organization can get by with those separate skill sets just connected through communication channels? Probably a good amount. And most kind of standard reporting, even the experimentation side of data science, most of those things can be, you know, can be achieved with those sorts of teams. But you might have certain needs that require more overlap. And the important thing is to recognize how prevalent those are in the organization so that you are not assuming that that team with separate skill structure will work for all of your initiatives. So I've just put a couple other examples here, but these, these can vary based on individual needs. Um, the one in the middle there is one that we're seeing more and more commonly, which is now that people have got analytic models that data scientists have created, the need to operationalize those or to create ML ops functions is really requiring much stronger overlap in your data science and data engineering skills. And it doesn't work to just have people in a team that know each. There needs to be some element of the team that has skills that span the two. Because the lines between what's data science and what's data engineering start to blur considerably when you think about the ML ops aspect of it. So when you think about um, continually monitoring your analytics models to make sure that um, they're not straying from the correct results, that everything that ev everything is getting retrained appropriately. At that point, your data engineering and data science skills have to be pretty strongly overlapped. So there's value, that, that's just kind of one example of it, but there's value in recognizing the sorts of initiatives that will require stronger overlap in different places and to think about how you will fulfill those overlap skills where you need them. And then on the right-hand side, some of the most transformational or complex analytic solutions are going to require multi-skilled team members. Um, it might be that they require all three of those skills. It might be that re they require two of those skills. But being able to identify the places where that's necessary will be really helpful in making sure you're bringing the most value to those really high um, value initiatives. And so I think my, you know, my advice in this one is to just think about what is the percentage of each of these in your organization? How will you recognize when something comes up that can't be satisfied with your kind of standard model? And then where do you plan to get those um, multi-skilled members when you need them? And that is really the thing that leads 
us to the next slide, which is how do you get the right skills in your organization? And there are kind of three main theories here that you can use. The first one is to build those skills. So you have some team members in your group that you trust. They might be really great data engineers. Can you build data science skills in them or vice versa? Can you take a business analyst and really enhance their data science understanding? There are some really strong positives to this in that you have existing relationships with these people. You know their strengths. You know their development needs. They have a lot of knowledge about the organization. And this tends to be less expensive if you can do it correctly. The con is that you've got to have really good learners and not everybody who was a great data engineer will ever be able to pick up the data science skills. Not every good business analyst will want to know anything more about um, data science or data engineering. So you've got to have the right people. Um, and given your experience, you might not have the experience within the company to train data engineers to be data scientists. So it requires you know, thinking about what is the company capable of in terms of building these skills? Is it something that you've got? You've got the skills elsewhere in the organization and, and you can help build it. It also takes some time because people don't learn these things quickly. And once they learn them, it's not that flexible because if you've trained skills in somebody but it's taken longer than it has taken for the technology to evolve, then there's some kind of question there about how you do that. Another approach is for some of these multi-skilled uh, bits is to borrow, and this is kind of using consultants or specialists or contractors for certain skills, bringing them into the team to provide that overlap where it's needed. Some of the pros are this is that it tends to be pretty flexible because you can bring people in as you need them, um, pay them for the amount of time that you need them for, and you tend to get better breadth and depth of skills here because um, consultants, specialist contractors will usually have been exposed to more things beyond like just your company situation. It also tends to be the quickest to implement if you have a trusted partner or you know somebody that you can go to for these things. The cons of this are that you don't actually own the talent at the end. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, you do start to create a dependency on a third party, which companies aren't always comfortable with. And the people that you bring in, though they might have good domain expertise, they might have limited company specific experience that some of your internal employees might have. So that might make it a little bit difficult to get the full benefit of what you're really after. And then though you might not be paying a full salary for these people, you will tend to pay a bit of a premium rate for those skills. So there's some consideration around costs there as well. And then the third option is really just to try to go out and buy these skills on the market. Um, so can you hire talent that have these skills and experiences? And some of the pros are this pros of this are that at the end of the day, you'll own that high caliber talent. It'll exist within your organization. It can be used to scale up others. Um, and in an ideal world, you can hire for the exact skill sets you're looking for. The cons are that we've heard many customers say like, this is kind of difficult to find right now. You might find people who span one or two categories, but spanning all three might be quite difficult. Um, also, you're always at the risk of attrition. Um, you've hired this talent, but if in a market where that talent is in high demand, it might be difficult to retain that talent or it might be very costly to retain that talent. You might also find that bringing in somebody new has limited company specific experience where building that in somebody in your organization already has that starting point. Um, and it's also a bit of a rigid solution. So if every time your needs evolve, you have to go out and hire somebody with those exact skills, it could be quite expensive because what you need might change and evolve over time and you might be acquiring talent and skills in different places that you can't adapt to other projects or other um, applications, and that could get to be an expensive endeavor. So I think that, what would my advice be on this? I think that there's a place for each of these types of approaches. And I think a lot of it depends on um, the last slide we looked at in thinking about what is the percentage of needs that you will have? How commonly will you need people that can really span two or three areas? And then what is your strategy to go in very intentionally and in thinking about what is the strategy for building capability where you need it, maybe borrowing it where you need it, and perhaps buying it where you need it. You don't have to follow just one of these strategies, but I think being a bit intentional and thinking about how you'll identify where you need it is really important because what you don't want to do is go in under the assumption that you can use a team that has separate skills and no overlap, find that it's not working before you think about how you bring that experience in because then you're under time pressures, it gets more costly and you've already invested time in something that's not working. So I think just proactively thinking about these sorts of models help organizations um, consider what their internal structures look like
to better facilitate the ability to bring in talent as and when needed. So I know we've run a bit over. I'll give you some quick concluding thoughts. We looked at grouping, linking, and aligning today as foundations to creating a structure and motivating people to work within that structure. We talked about every grouping approach having strengths and weaknesses, and it being important to recognize at a macro level where your analytics organization fits so that you can think about how you make the most of the pros and mitigate some of the cons. We talked about the value of designing these well-rounded teams and to really think about what skills necessitate different, sorry, what needs necessitate different types of skill profiles. And then we thought of, and we also talked about really giving proactive consideration to how you'll get the right skills where, when you'll need them and leveraging a build, borrow, buy strategy to be very intentional about um, how you staff your teams and how you make sure that they're geared up for success. So that is all I've got today on the topic. I'm more than happy to talk more one on one with people if you have any thoughts or questions or just want to chat. Um, we do have some upcoming webcasts that I've listed here, which you may be interested in. Um, productionizing analytics solutions actually is one that I think might be of interest if you are really interested in that data science, data engineering crossover, because that that's a place where I think that overlap of skills is really necessary. And then bringing advanced analytics to the business is another one that I'll be running that talks a little bit about um, how you can get your whole analytics organization thinking more in a business minded way and how you can get the business really accepting and adopting those um, approaches. So um, a couple options coming up here, but always um, check our website for more of these free events. And I will leave you today just with my contact information. Uh, thank you for joining me. Feel free to reach out um, and I uh, hope you guys enjoy the rest of your day.